Hi everyone, it's John here again. It is Saturday, September 25th, 2021. I have uh, a, a little window of opportunity here that I wasn't expecting, so I'm trying to produce some uh, foundational content for my channel, and I am rushing a bit, I admit that, but I just, because of circumstances, don't get the opportunity to have the privacy or the time to concentrate on these kinds of things, and I just feel this sense of importance to get this kind of stuff out there. And what I want to talk about right now is uh, the climate crisis. And I want to do that because, as I've said before, I, it's a subject I have spent a great deal of time studying. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not technically a scientist at all. Uh, but I did devote a tremendous amount of time to studying and following the subject for uh, quite a few years. And I actually engaged with quite a few people who are actually working in the field. So uh, now this is a subject just so that people know that has been studied far in far greater detail than any other subject in human history because of the gravity of the situation and the implications of it. Uh, we are basically modifying the biosphere of an entire planet and the consequences are profoundly significant, everything from sea level rise to extreme weather to temperature changes to how that influences crops and uh, natural ecosystems, ocean acidification, which is actually one of the most terrifying aspects of it, um, and so on. And, you know, these kinds of changes have occurred on the planet before, but in natural, uh, by natural means, short of something like an asteroid strike, uh, these ch kinds of changes would take place over many thousands, if not even millions of years. Now, what has the, the rate of change that's occurring here now has all occurred within roughly 200 years, which is, you know, a tiny fraction of time in the Earth's uh, biological history. So a very, very rapid change doesn't allow ecosystems or species much time to adapt at all. And we are now... Uh, it largely, it's largely agreed that we are, we are, we have triggered the sixth great mass extinction event on the planet, and it's called the Anthropocene because it is human caused. Now, one of the things, the problems here is, is that this is going to impact every aspect of civilization and society and human affairs on the planet and of course it's also going to have a similar impact on every other organism that survives here and um, these changes you know there seems to me that there's a lot of people who believe that oh we'll just go plant a bunch of trees and solve this problem or we'll come up with some kind of techno fix or and even taken to, to its extreme, it could be solar radiation management or geoengineering, both of which are profoundly risky and dangerous, potentially, uh, and um, have, you know, uh, implications that we don't even understand. So, <clears throat> as I have said before, it was 10 or 15 years ago when, personally, I was had the opinion that we should declare a global state of emergency because of the significance of this situation. Um, but again, what concerns me most is, is that I think that a lot of people have a false sense of security, and that may just be because this, the, the problem is so immense and has so much gravity that people are unable to wrap their heads around it and so an easy way to deal with it is to just kind of ignore it or, you know, you know it's going on, but there's not much that you as an individual can do about it, which is actually true. Um, and so you go about your life, you know, kind of like business as usual and just hope that the problem will go away. <clears throat> well, because this is a global problem, it's going to require uh, global participation and cooperation to resolve. Now... The, the fundamental thing that's going on here is, is that our modern civilization or our contemporary civilization was built on the backs of the Industrial Revolution, you know, for the last 200 years of human activity. Um, and the, <clears throat> the inevitable conclusion, if, you're, if you really 
you know, think about this situation is, is that that civilization is literally untenable and unsustainable. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is a fact. Now, that has, like, really significant implications. It has huge significant, huge implications for the economy, uh, for industry, for business, for corporations, for the financial system, and so on. If you take all of that stuff that is generating all of the, these emissions out of the equation, what are you left with? Do we go back to some kind of agrarian society like we, you know, might have had, uh, you know, 400 years ago or something like that? Um, if it was me and I was in charge and could, I would just say, that's it, we're shutting down industrial civilization. We would only produce what we need to survive. You know, we would reuse um, and we would limit growth at least until we could develop alternative forms of energy and so forth that didn't uh, contribute to the problem. And yes, I mean, you know, I'm all in favor of green energy, like wind and solar, hydropower and so on, where it's environmentally feasible and not too destructive. But even it takes energy to make solar panels and so forth. And, you know, you need to mine and you need... To, I'm not saying that... They, I'm not comparing them to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are... I've got to go, absolutely. Um, and yeah, we need energy. But my point is, is that we can't just... Going to net zero emissions is a very, very daunting challenge. Now, so if... I know that in the scientific community, they're very, very clear about this situation. And as I have expressed in, an, in another video, um, they are very cautious in how they communicate because they do not want to be perceived as being an alarmist, even though being an alarmist is probably called for because they don't want to undermine their standing in the scientific community because scientists just don't typically talk very emotively. Um, and so uh, the main point of this is that there is no simple techno fixes, you know, built into the IPCC reports, the, the one that most people are familiar with is, is it, is a, is a document that's created for policymakers. And it's not the same thing as the foundational science beneath that that actually um, uh, describes the problem in much more detail. The one that is for policymakers is actually influenced often in, in many ways by uh, corporate and political interests. And of course, you know, the, the people who are at the top of the heap or, you know, politicians and so forth don't really like to bring bad news to people. So there's a tendency to sort of greenwash things and make the situation not look as actually bad as it is because who does it serve by, you know, bringing people bad news? Um, but the bottom line is, is that, and this is the really important part, is that, like I said, you know, we can't just go plant a ton of more trees. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Like, you know, we need a certain amount of land for, land for agriculture. Um, uh, you know, there's only so many places you can put trees where they will survive, if they will survive, you know, given the climatic changes and so forth. Uh, there's another thing too that I often see people say, well, it's about, you know, the popul it's a population problem. You know, personally, I find it really insulting when um, people just look at a really complicated situation and make statements like that it's as if the scientists who've been working on this problem, and there's been many thousands of them, incredibly brilliant people, um, as if they haven't already thought about all of these things. And, you know, <laughs> so, 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 so some casual observer basically says, oh, it's, you know, the problem is population. Oh, you yeah, know, why didn't I think of that? Come on, like, seriously. Um, here's the thing about population is, is that if we look at it cumulatively and historically and even contemporarily, the people in the, who live in the so-called developed world on a per capita basis produce vastly more emissions than people uh, in other parts of the world that are, you know, quote unquote, the developing world or whatever. So uh, also, and if we look at it on a consumption basis, you know, when we buy products that are made in China, we are effectively uh, subsidizing the production of those goods for our own needs. They're, they're not going to some poor country somewhere else. They're, you know, they're not getting the 50-inch uh, uh, high-definition TV. They're coming to here. So we are, the, we are actually responsible for 
the emissions that are related to the production of all of the goods that we consume. And let's face it, we consume a lot of goods that we don't really need to consume. So that's a whole other thing, which is consumption. Uh, so if, if we wanted to sort of level the playing field in terms of emissions, the people in the developed, the so-called developed world would take an enormous hit in their cap capacity to produce emissions, which would require truly radical changes to the way they live. Um, and here's another thing, too. We, we, you know, the whole 1.5C of global warming target that's set forth in the Paris Agreement, even that is a, is a hotly con, uh, debated subject of whether actually 1.5C is actually safe or not. I mean, if we look at you know, we're only now at around 1C. Look at the changes that are occurring now. It's just crazy. Like, I mean, you can read any publication in the world. It's just pretty, that's credible. And you'll find, you'll hear stories about what's happening, you know, droughts occurring all over the world and, you know, wildfires and uh, crop failures and, you know, extreme weather patterns and so forth. This is only at one point, this is only around 1C, right? So, we're probably right now on a path to at least three or C or more by the end of the century, which puts us into a, you know, a realm, you know, that hasn't been seen on the earth for like million, you know, millions of years. Uh, you know, in fact, the last time CO2 levels were where they are now at just above 400 parts per million, there were, you know, uh, plants growing at the South pole. Then there was hardly any land ice. So, you know, you're looking at like 100 feet of sea level rise or, you know, 30 meters, 20 or 30 meters of sea level rise on that basis alone. Now, that's not going to happen overnight, but it's, it would inevitably. Um, that would, you know, southern Florida is mostly at one meter above sea level rise. So there goes half of a highly populated state with billions or if not trillions of dollars worth of real estate assets. How do you just take, and not, you know, if we include other low-lying areas as well, how do you take trillions of dollars worth of assets off the books without, you know, complete collapse of the financial system or the economy? No, you can't, right? So, and that's just real estate. That doesn't include all the other things like, you know, hundreds of millions of people, if not, you know, having to migrate due to changing climatic conditions. You know, the whole Midwestern uh, US is going to run out of water, right? And what do you do? I mean, you know, people say things like, oh, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll desalinate water. Well, you know, that's something that only occurs on a very small scale now and only for a very few people, um, at least at this point in time, we don't have that technology, and it and it uses a tremendous amount of energy, which of course produces more emissions, depending on how that energy is sourced. Uh, and so, you know, you can take any one of these sort of issues, and if you really analyze it, you find out that it's far more complicated and more challenging than you think. So, now if we carry on the path that we're on, you know. You know, civilizational collapse is definitely uh, not off the table. Um, and depending on how bad it gets, you know, it could even get to the point where our, the survival of our species is at stake. That's how bad the situation could get. You can't, for example, collapse the marine uh, uh, food web without significantly altering the entire planet. And as the oceans acidify, you know, uh, there are many organisms that will simply not be able to survive in the oceans anymore. And for example, phytoplankton produce 40, 50% of the world's oxygen. You know, so you can, I'm, I don't want to get too much into the weeds. The main point of all of this is, is that this situation is extremely important. It's probably more important than any other uh, issue that faces humanity now. And I can say that, you know, we're dealing with a global health crisis right now. Uh, which, uh, you know, has killed millions of people. But if the climate situation gets out of control, we could be talking about hundreds of millions or billions of people being at risk. Um, plus, uh, all of this destabilized situation that that would create could cause all kinds of wars and famine and things like that, that, um, you know, would be 
uh, we, we don't even want to think about. Uh, so, yeah, there are no simple fixes, um, you know, uh, to give you one more example, you know, solar radiation management or per putting reflective particles into the stratosphere uh, to reflect sunlight uh, is something that's being discussed. Well, that's never been done before um, intentionally, intentionally, um, and we don't know how that would affect the climate in different regions of the world. And you would have to get basically everybody on the planet to agree to do that. Well, what if you're a country, let's say you're China, and it's going to severely impact your agricultural system? Um, what do you do? <laughs> do you, you know, if one country does it again, you know, it could start a war. Um, and it could also uh, cr create sort of winners and losers on the planet where some people benefit from it and others don't. And then there's another question, which is, well, what happened if you stop where, if carbon dioxide emissions continue to increase and then you stop the solar radiation management or it gets interrupted, would the temperature spike dramatically and rapidly back to where it should be once there's the particles have filtered themselves out of the stratosphere? Uh, you would have, uh, and that could be uh, catastrophic. And, you know, let's face it, um, our civilization is 2,000 years old, roughly, uh, and modern civilization. And, um, you know, we're talking about a situation that could persist for many thousands of years. And who's going to be here to sort of keep an eye on things? You know, civilizations have come and gone. And, you know, who's going to keep that, those kinds of... Um, "Quote unquote" solutions in play for thousands of years. Um, so, really, the the smart thing to do is to uh, globally get everyone to agree to dramatically reduce emissions as quickly as possible. Um, it almost like under uh, an emergency type situation. What, what does that look like? Does that mean getting all the internal combustion cars off the road within a few years? You know, what what does that mean? Uh, Agriculture is a major production of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and particularly meat and dairy. Uh, do we got to take them off the table? How are people going to respond to that? Uh, you know, there are going to be regions of the world which are going to be borderline uninhabitable. Uh, what happens to all those people? Where do they go? What happens to all the low-lying coastal areas, or even ones that are just uh, prone to ramp uh, to amped up? Uh, hurricanes, uh, and so forth, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that really needs to be considered. Um, it's very complex. And like I said, it's, it's the biggest problem because it's a problem that's going to be with us for a very long time. I think, as I said earlier, if we just stopped all emissions today, it would take thousands of years for the earth to sequester all that carbon that we have pumped into the atmosphere to get us back to where we started at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole other thing too, which is, you know, the uh, positive feedbacks, where the real concern is that we could get to a point where the temperature increases to the point, the, 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 the mean global temperature increases to the point where we trigger feedback loops, which results in a process that we can no longer control. That's the big, the biggest, scariest thing. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of debate about what that point is. Um, but that's what we want to avoid for sure. Like, for example, if, if the Arctic gets start, if we, if the Arctic starts to melt too much, then we start, it starts pumping out methane, which is a, an even more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It, it eventually breaks down into carbon dioxide over 20 years or so. But initially, it's much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And then, you know, the temperature increases, more permafrost melts, and then, you know, we can't stop that. It's a, like a runaway train. Um, that's what we want to avoid. So, <clears throat> but the real fundamental thing about this from a societal perspective is, is that our economy, uh, capitalism as we know it, and what has uh, brought civilization to its current state, all of the... Um, all of the the building blocks of that are basically on the chopping block here because, you know, 
we cannot continue to do what we've been doing for the last 200 years and survive. Uh, so the changes that are going to occur are very dramatic. I really actually think that, this, you know, the smartest thing would be for us to all individually absolutely reduce travel to absolute minimum, uh, consumption to absolute minimum, um, energy, energy consumption to an absolute minimum. Um, and we, as individuals, right? And of course, like I said, you know, this is not stuff that, this is not a problem that as individuals we can solve. It has to be solved collectively, which is, you know, hopefully uh, something we can do. Uh, and because I know a lot of people are probably already thinking about this, I'm going to address this notion of uh, mechanically sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, the IPCC and its reports had baked in a lot of assumptions about future technology that would have this capability. <clears throat> but it has not been demonstrated on any kind of meaningful scale that is in any way remotely economically or financially viable. None. <clears throat> you know, the concept of <laughs> having these huge machines that are just going to basically suck carbon di dioxide out of the atmosphere, convert them into some solid substance or pump them into uh, empty oil wells or underground or something, where, which it were, of course, they could gradually escape anyway over time, or they would inevitably. Um, <clears throat> on, to do this on a meaningful scale, in, as far as I'm concerned, is just absolutely ridiculous. That was kind of um, a ploy to minimize the actions that would be have been required in the past or to reduce the state of alarm or whatever um, it's utter nonsense there is no industrial scale way technology uh, on, that would affect the global biosphere in any meaningful way that is uh, remotely viable and probably never will be it, that was just a pipe dream and probably like i said to uh, deflect from the severity of the crisis um, so, you know, because of course doing something like that on a large scale would require vast amounts of energy and you still need to get the energy from somewhere. Here's another thing, you know, like some people would argue that, oh, well, we've got to go nuclear. Well, nuclear has all kinds of problems. Like where, what do you do with the waste that's radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years? <clears throat> and you still have to mine for uranium and then you have to get permission to build these things and put them up. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about small scale reactors and well, we'll see what happens. But, you know, a lot of people don't aren't very comfortable with the idea of nuclear energy. And um, the other thing, of course, is that we need to make these really radical changes within the next 20 years. And some of these nuclear projects can take decades to get built. So <clears throat> there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no quick fix for any of this. Uh, another thing, and, you know, <clears throat> this is a bit of a stream of consciousness. Like I said, I I'm, I'm, don't have any of this scripted. <clears throat> but if it's true that what we re really uh, desperately need to do is radically reduce our consumption of products and resources, what does that do to the economy? How does the economy as we know it survive if people are consuming the bare minimum, which is almost guaranteed what we need to do? How do how how are people employed? How do they earn money? <laughs> well, you know, they're not going to be going to factories producing junk, uh, you know, um, or we're not going to be cutting down forests to make toilet paper or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's a huge question. Now, no politician or, you know, thought leader out there who has, who cares about their popularity is going to tell people like, oh, you know, uh, sorry, you can't, you know, buy sh crap anymore. And, uh, and you're not going to have a job, by the way, you know. So, you know, people would argue that, well, we take all of these people, we put them to, into producing green technology. I still, you know, there's no way around this problem, uh, unless we want to go into catastrophic outcomes. Uh, there's no way uh, to resolve this problem without dramatically reducing our emissions, like in in radical ways. And the only way to do that is to uh, radically reduce our consumption and production and the, the extraction of natural resources, which, like I said, would completely collapse the global economy. <clears throat> Another thing, of course, is that <clears throat> who would want to be in charge of 
millions of people who are who are in a situation of economic uncertainty that would surely ensue you know this gets really complicated really fast right and then you know you're going to have you know let's say that the glaciers in the himalayas uh, melt and you know for a while you're going to have surges of water downstream and you know into india and pakistan but uh, when it get it'll get to a point where the water stops flowing what, ha- what you know and then you've got hundreds of you've got billions of people who re- had formerly relied on those those rivers for agriculture and survival what happens now do they fight over those that critical natural resource i mean you can get into a situation where you could see where co- the kind of cooperation <clears throat> that would be required to cope with a crisis like this could be very hard pressed to come by so again you know think it through in depth and you, you know it, you can see how much of a pandora's box this whole situation is i want to also say just my own personal experience like i said before i devoted a years of my time volunteer years of my time to helping uh or you know provide accurate information on this subject because there's an awful lot of inaccurate information provided or developed by vested interests you know the fossil fuel industry has literally trillions of dollars worth of untapped resources sitting in the ground that they would like to exploit because they are profit driven um and what happened to me though is that after doing that for a number of years i got uh in i actually got into like a state of depression because um like i said when you think this through you, you start to look at the future and you go like holy crap you know i mean you can get depressed just looking at you know species extinctions which to me is like a horrific crime but uh so what happened was that i had to stop I had to turn my eyes away from this something that I recognized was probably the most profoundly significant thing that had happened in modern human history or that was occurring in modern human history uh because it was making me incredibly depressed um and so you know I I keep tabs on it I just I don't get into too many details but I'll just you know I follow the news enough to see what's going on around the world but I'm not nearly as engaged as I was years ago, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Uh for that reason, just because uh it was taking too much of a toll on me emotionally and personally. So, uh even now, like today as I sat and reflected upon, you know, producing this, um and I sort of tapped back into that space that I was in where where I was very engaged, you know, it's it's a difficult subject for me to even talk about. Uh I recall years ago reading a a story about a a marine biologist who was one of the first people to sort of really identify what was going on with the emotion with the oceans and ocean acidification and she, it was described how when she had the realization of how of the effect that this was having on the global marine web uh she she couldn't stop crying because she understood the implications you know like i said if the, if the if the marine uh, uh ecosystem collapses it's kind of like game over right? you know we, people have no idea of what we're playing with here now you know <laughs> i hope as well as uh, everyone else that you know it's possible that we will develop solutions in the future that we don't already have we sure as hell can't sit on our laurels about that that's not the right approach because you know we can't roll the dice with the planet um you know this notion of that we're going to populate other planets is just is com- to me is just completely absurd i mean it's possible that maybe a handful of people could go you know set up camp on mars but i mean what about the other you know the other billions of us um so i don't see how we get through this situation without either a pretty uh bad outcome or radical changes like truly radical changes to the degree that would probably shock a lot of people and one of my biggest concerns is that like i said that the leadership 
there's probably nobody on the planet who's in a leadership position who wants to deliver this message to anybody because you know they would lose their support <laughs> they their, their backers would would turn away from them you know our political systems are geared to be influenced by vested corporate interests to a large degree uh and plutocrats and you know like how do we deal with it on that level because that's the level that it needs to happen on um we're not on track to get to where we need to be at all right now um and there's a lot of people who actually believe that we have may may have already gone too far now i'm not a nihilist i would be the last person to throw in the towel like i would fight to the bitter end and you know we have to, what we should be doing is that this should be like the absolute number one priority for humanity, bar none. You know, uh, we carry on obviously with all the other systems that are required, but this one is should be at the forefront of everybody's attention. When I was doing, engaged in this uh, 10 or more years ago, you know, um, it wasn't reported on very much in the media. And at least I can say now that it's kind of like front page news, like constantly now, which is which is a big step forward because it, it was a difficult back then to, because the media, you know, there's only so many times they can report on something um, that's abstract uh, because people just won't read it. I guess what's happening now is, is that these extreme weather events and whatnot are occurring so frequently and they touch people directly. So now people have to pay attention. So anyway, I want to put that out there because I think it's foundational to everything. And, um, you know, I would like people in the spiritual community to talk more about, you know, what we do about the planet because it really matters. Um, and um, I'm not personally interested in wishful thinking. I think that uh, the responsible thing for us to do is to do everything within our power with the knowledge and information and options at hand to tackle this issue. I am currently situated in Nova Scotia, Canada, the province of Nova Scotia. And I recently spent 10 months living in the woods. And one of the really disturbing things that's occurring there is that the forests are dying off and getting killed off by invasive pests. Um, these are pests that were brought to this region from other parts of the world uh, that are not indigenous to this area and the local species of trees have no natural immunity or defense mechanisms against these pests. And so you'll see trees that get infected and then within a year or two or three, tree is dead. Uh, so these species have existed here for thousands of years. The other thing, of course, is, is that the winters are not as cold or we don't have as prolonged cold periods as we used to and in the past those cold temperatures would kill off a lot of these uh, pests that's just not occurring to the same degree that it used to now uh, this also occurred in the forests of British Columbia with the Japanese pine beetle and it wiped out huge tracts of forest uh, within a fairly short time span um, in the province of British Columbia very disturbing I also presume that eventually this will occur to the boreal forest, which is, covers a vast tract of uh, northern Canada, which is almost unpopulated. Uh, it, but it's a very huge region, and the boreal forest is, is a, one of the major carbon sinks on the planet. I, and there's no way to prevent this because of the scale of it, right? You can't just, it's just, we're talking about vast, you know, thousands of square miles or kilometers. Uh, so, you know, again, this notion, oh, we'll just plant a bunch of trees is not as simple as it, as it may sound initially because it's, again, these are complicated situations. When I was a kid, you, if you drove your car at night in the summer, your windshield would be completely covered in blood, bug splatters. And now there's almost none. I mean, that alone is completely alarming because insects are a critical component of the ecosystem and they're food source and pollinators uh, for many other organisms and just the insect apocalypse is, alone is is really frightening there is even uh, now concern that the atlantic meridional 
overturning circulation, AMOC, uh, could slow down due to changes in salinity and temperatures of the North Atlantic. And this basically carries warm water from the equatorial regions north. And so uh, Eastern Canada and Western Europe could be uh, severely impacted if that was to occur. Um, the, in particular in uh, Western Europe, much of it is not prepared for the kind of conditions that would ensue with, if that would occur. Uh, and um, it's now considered in the realm of possibility. So that's another striking example of things that can go wrong. I keep thinking of things that I neglected to mention, and I apologize for that. Again, it's not scripted, and uh, forgive me for that. And I'm no doubt I'm going to publish this, and then I'm going to think of a whole bunch of things I should have said. But yeah, I'll have to do it later. Um, there's two things I want to add for sure right now. One is is that uh, the IPCC assessments, which are issued every few years, are, are have been notoriously conservative. Like the reality uh, that that is manifesting in in the real world is ha is happening way faster uh, than uh, what was anticipated, uh, and so we have to take that into account for sure. Um, and also, there's always new evidence, uh, new research that's coming out that typically paints a more dire picture, uh, which is far more the case than the opposite. Uh, and that has to be considered as well. Uh, and finally, I think the main point of all of this is, is that what we've been doing, you know, Lyndon B. Johnson was uh, first warned about this, I believe, in 1966 as something of concern, right? So, you know, for... Um, for like whatever, what is that, 50 years, 40 years, we've been sort of waffling on this and engaging in all kinds of wishful thinking. And, you know, the time for that has come and gone um, because we're at the, like at a minute before midnight and um, we have to do this. Like, we, we don't have a choice, and I'm getting chills as I'm saying this. If we want to preserve a habitable planet for ourselves and for future generations, um, uh, uh, you know, Gaia can shake us off uh, in the blink of an eye if she really wants to. Um, and so it's, us to, it's up to us to take the bull by the horns. And, you know, if we're, um, if we're going to be dealing with reality... We can't just uh, sit around and be twiddling our thumbs. We need to get, we need to get into action, and it, we can't also, I think, anymore wait around for politicians, you know, with all of their agendas, conflicting agendas, to do the right thing. Somehow, we have to get beyond them and the status quo and the powers that be. Um, and I'm not even sure that you know protesting is going to be enough. I mean, because the level of action that is required is extremely dramatic, if not radical. The only other threat that would be comparable that would be under our control as humans would be nuclear Armageddon. Uh, that, you know, in my opinion. Thanks for liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing. I really appreciate it, and I will talk to you again soon.